Welcome to The Origin of the Pyramid. The origin of the word pyramid is controversial. Most believe that it originates with the Greek word pyramis, which referred to a bread of conical shape. Life and death in ancient Egypt were modeled on the cycle of the sun. The perfect shape of the smooth-faced pyramid became associated with the metaphor of the pharaoh transformed into one of the sun's rays in death. Pyramids represented the Benben, the primordial mound of the Heliopolitan creation myth. These stories permeated every aspect of Egyptian life to a greater or lesser extent. During the pre-dynastic period, the development of funerary practices was different depending on whether one was located in Lower Egypt or Upper Egypt. Well before the pyramid, there was the burial pits. It is on the site of Marimde Beni Salome in Lower Egypt that we find the oldest funerary site, dating back to 5000 BCE. Study of the tombs revealed that the bodies of the deceased were deposited in a shallow grave in a fetal position. Though a few objects were recovered from these graves, they offered no insight as to the social class of those interred within. In Upper Egypt, pre-dynastic practices are easier to study, but reveal more complex funerary rites. They are divided into two cultural phases, Bedarian and Nagada. The Bedarian phase ranged from 4400 BCE to 3800 BCE. Small necropolises were discovered on the outskirts of villages, revealing the emergence of a funerary cult. The bodies of the deceased were lowered into an oval grave and covered with goat or gazelle skins. Items needed in everyday life were added alongside the body. During the three Nagata periods ranging from 4000 BCE to 3510 BCE, funerary practices evolved in complexity. The shape of tombs changed from oval to rectangular, mimicking the homes of the living. The size of the burials increased and funerary items became more stylized and numerous. Tombs gained complexity with masonry, wooden veneers or raw bricks added to strengthen the structures. In time, socially stratified necropolises emerged. For example, in Hierakonopolis, the elite and commoners had separate necropolises. The term mastaba, meaning massive bench in dialectal Arabic, refers to a form of funerary architecture that was present in Egypt from the Archaic period to the Middle Kingdom. An evolution of the burial pit, mastabas were generally composed of two parts. A structure was built above the ground in the form of a massive rectangle with stepped walls, and a subterranean burial chamber was located underneath. Smaller mastabas often surrounded the much larger tomb of the king. 
These generally held the remains of the king's relatives and courtiers. The arrangement of the substructure of the Mastaba evolved during the course of the Old Kingdom. From the 5th dynasty onwards, Mastabas often featured multi-roomed substructures, with sometimes up to 30 rooms. Also, the quantity and quality of decorated surfaces increased noticeably, as well as the number of statues found within. The 6th dynasty would see art used to its utmost. The entire surface of a mastaba would be covered in scenes of daily life, illustrating the prosperity of those lucky enough to comfortably spend eternity near the pyramid of a pharaoh. The best example of this type of mastaba is the tomb of Mararuka in Saqqara. Welcome to the Step Pyramid Complex of Djoser. The Step Pyramid is at the center of an enclosed complex comprised of temples, models of palaces, and artificial constructions, all built for the afterlife of Pharaoh Djoser. The funeral complex itself covers 15 hectares and is located on the highest point of the Saqqara Plateau. It's clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this was a technological marvel of its time. The only fragment of information regarding the design plans of the complex was discovered on a section of stone containing an architectural sketch of a vault. The Step Pyramid is the first monument built of stone. Standing at 60 meters high, it was the tallest of its time. Built 4,700 years ago, it was originally intended as a mastaba, which was a flat-roofed rectangular tomb. Its famous architect, Imhotep, may have felt this was too humble for the great Pharaoh Djoser and began to add the steps. The step pyramid complex is enclosed within a 1600 meter long wall that is 10 meters high. This large wall was made out of white limestone and oriented along the north-south axis. While there are 14 doors, only its eastern door was intended to accommodate the living. The remaining false doors were built as portals for the king's ka to pass through. Along with false doorways, the walls were designed with bastions and steeples resembling a defensive wall. The positioning of these design elements suggest that they were related to the Hebsed festival.
The only real entrance into the complex is at the end of a long, narrow passageway. This enclosure has a stone canopy carved to resemble wooden logs. At the end of the passage is a large opening. Meant to resemble a doorway, it has carved doors and hinges that are permanently open and immovable. The corridor is lined with 20 pairs of columns up to six meters high, built by stacking stone drums. The completed facade was made to resemble reed stock bundles. Traces of red paint were found on the columns, along with black paint on the support walls. This would have had the effect of blending the walls into the shadows to give the red columns the illusion of standing on their own. Chambers are located on either side of the columns and are thought to be chapels representing the provinces of Upper and Lower Egypt. According to some Egyptologists, the arrangement of the rooms may be symbolic of jurisdiction and judgment. Guarded by a line of carved snakes, this tomb is located at the southern end of the courtyard. The burial chamber is beneath it, down a 30 meter deep shaft. The low ceiling chamber resembles a mastaba and is relatively intact compared to the later burial chamber. The tomb is made of pink granite, though there is evidence it was once polished limestone. Too small for a body, it is possible that the tomb was intended for the king's ka, or to hold the canopic jars containing the king's organs. Later traditions in burials would have the canopic jars in the same chamber as the body. The first limestone staircase leads west from the tomb to underground apartments. Some of these rooms were intended to accommodate the king and his family in the afterlife. Many large jars of pottery were found, including some that still had deposits of beer, milk and oil inside them. The false doorways are decorated with reliefs of the king taking part in rituals. In these reliefs, he is seen carrying agricultural tools, running, and performing a ritual for the reanimation of the deceased. The architect Imhotep chose stone as a building material in order for the complex to last. Following the completion of the initial mastaba, Imhotep devised a burial of more ambitious dimensions. He set about stacking mastabas on top of each other. Evidence shows that the pyramid was enlarged twice by additional cuts into the steps, eventually reaching 62 meters in height and 121 meters by 109 meters at its base. The staircase allowing the pharaoh to enter the divine world was represented by a tiered pyramid, oblong in shape, 
completely enveloping the original mastaba. The pyramid itself is a solid structure. All of the chambers and tunnels are beneath the structure. Pharaoh Djoser the Sacred was the founder of the Third Dynasty. He ruled for 19 years. During his reign, he was known as Horus Najeriket, divine of the body. He was given the name Djoser several centuries after his death as a sign of respect, and he is regarded as one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. An apocrypha was drafted in his name during the Ptolemaic period. 2,500 years after his death. Djoser was associated with the sky god Horus in his human form. A plinth near the steppe pyramid is inscribed with his name and associated with Horus. He was the first to reside in Memphis, making it the central hub of government for the region. Djoser was known to have built many temples and monuments before the complex at Saqqara. The funerary complex was the first of its kind and would mark Djoser's greatest architectural achievement. The funerary complex was built to resemble Djoser's palace with the stone carved to imitate mud brick, trees, and reeds. Creating these details and softer textures in hard stone would have been a time-consuming, labor-intensive task. Much of the complex is designed to accommodate the Hebsed festival, allowing the king the ability to affirm his rule even in the afterlife. <laughs> In the corner is a temple referred to as T. This temple is among the most mysterious structures in the complex. Its outer facade is plain, while inside it is decorated with intricate jed pillars and carvings. It's possible that this place was intended to be where the Ka of the King materialized, symbolically visiting the platform of the Hebsed courtyard from the afterlife. The Hebsed festival enabled the pharaoh to maintain universal order and renew godly powers. Through a series of trials and religious rites, such as dance, offerings, and visiting the sanctuaries of various deities, the ruler's vital force and divine nature was confirmed. The celebration was meant to represent the ruler's jubilee and would take place every 30 years, though the deadline was not always followed. The earliest known ritual dates from the first dynasty. Within the complex of Djoser, southeast of the pyramid, is a dedicated space for this essential ritual to be performed by the king even in the afterlife. The Hebsed courtyard is lined with false chapels and equipped with a platform featuring two staircases meant to represent Upper and Lower Egypt.
Located in the courtyard, the two pavilions are believed to represent the palaces of Upper and Lower Egypt. Rectangular in shape, the two replica structures face one another. Their facade is similar to the chapels of the Hebsed ceremony, with column crowns carved to look like falling leaves. Because Queen Hetepernepti and Princess Inetkas' names were discovered on a stela near the pavilions, it is thought that these funerary chapels were intended for them. The funerary temple is on the north side of the complex, facing the stars where the deceased ruler was believed to travel after death. Within this temple was the pharaoh's serdab, or cellar. It is a small, enclosed space with one wall sloped to match the first step of the pyramid. The north wall has two observation holes. A statue of Djoser is seated on the throne, wearing a mantle and a tripartite wig with a crown known as a Nemes. Representing the king's Ka, this statue looks through the observation holes into the courtyard, enabling the king to observe the ceremonies and receive offerings in the afterlife. Welcome to Inside Djoser's Step Pyramid. The architect of the Step Pyramid, Imhotep, was a man of great importance to Pharaoh Djoser and ancient Egyptians in general. The base of a statue of Djoser, discovered in 1926, celebrates Imhotep as a carpenter, sculptor, stonemaker, and chief of the seers. Little is known of Imhotep's day-to-day -day life. While he is credited for writing medical texts, it is for his role of architect that he is most famously known. From the design of the pyramid to the elements within the complex itself, Imhotep set out to create something that would immortalize his king. An architectural achievement, the step pyramid was made from stone blocks instead of mud brick. It was the first time Egyptians built a monument of that height. Imhotep explicitly intended for the stone to reflect natural materials. The funerary complex of Djoza remained famous throughout the centuries and millennia, and its great architect, Imhotep, was deified by ancient Egyptians during the late period. In addition to the central subterranean palace built for Djoser, 11 wells were dug. Each went to a depth of 33 meters, 
and connected with a horizontal gallery extending for about 20 meters. The first five galleries were intended for members of the royal family. Two passages lead underground and branch off in three directions to various magazine galleries. This vast underground space accommodated sections for storage and ceremonial offerings. One of the tunnels, starting on the east side of the pyramid, contained 40,000 stone vessels, many of them belonging to the king's ancestors. The burial chamber of Djoser is located at the bottom of a 28-meter deep central shaft. According to Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer, the chamber was originally made from polished blocks of limestone, while its ceiling was decorated in five-pointed stars. At some point, however, the limestone blocks were replaced entirely by pink granite blocks, leaving behind only fragments of limestone blocks decorated with stars. At the foot of the chamber are many tunnels going in all directions. This maze of tunnels, galleries and chambers stretches over five kilometers. There are a number of dead ends and false doors. They may have been intended for the afterlife rather than to fool thieves. Unlike the Great Pyramid of Giza or Menkara, the Pyramid of Djoser does not have any extra openings dug out by thieves. There was no need for them. Because of the easy access into the tunnels and along the corridors, thieves had little trouble clearing out the temples once inside. It is unknown when the mummy of Djoser was stolen. All that remained was a left foot, found by French Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer in 1934. This architect, who devoted his whole life to meticulously exploring the complex, believed it belonged to Djoser. The Pharaoh's Apartments, also known as the Blue Chambers, are decorated with blue-green tiles meant to imitate the reed matting that covered the walls and windows of his palace. The stone is carefully curved and painted to look like the rolled mats of open doorways and curtains.
there are two long rooms running side by side along a north-south axis. The south room has false doors separated by stone panels, while the north room is a corridor which allows access to side chambers. Nearby chambers originally housed the pharaoh's treasures. The door frames are made of fine limestone and carved with the king's name. As in the south tomb, reliefs are carved into the doorways. These reliefs show the king performing rituals and visiting divine sanctuaries for all eternity. Their interiors are fictive additions made by the team to add to the wonders of the tomb. It is clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this funerary monument was a technological marvel of its time. Welcome to Sneferu's First Pyramid. With the long reign of Sneferu, the first king of the Fourth Dynasty, the most brilliant and creative period began for the construction of funerary monuments in Egypt. Funerary monument design moved from the step pyramid to the smooth-faced pyramid, testament to the evolution of the practices of construction. The first attempt at this design was the Pyramid of Medum. While Sneferu's monument started as a seven-stepped pyramid, it was later altered into an eight-stepped structure. The final phase of construction saw the steps filled out and an outer casing applied to achieve a smooth surface.
The smooth dressing of the walls did not provide sufficient bonding, however, and the outer casing did not rest on sound foundations. As a result, the bases of the four outer buttress walls gave way, causing the walls to slide down and collapse. While the Meidum pyramid was abandoned due to design flaws, it showcased other innovations that would impact all future pyramid designs. As well as the smooth sides, it was the first time a ceremonial pavement was built, leading from the valley to the temple of the pyramid. Another innovation was that of the funerary chamber, which was no longer at the bottom of a well, but rather above ground level. This change signaled the beginning of the three-bedroom system. Welcome to the Bent Pyramid of Dashur. After the construction of the Meidum Pyramid failed, Sneferu transferred his residence and the official necropolis to Dashur. There he began construction on his second attempt at a funerary monument. The resulting structure, known as the Bent Pyramid, is the only one of its shape in Egypt. Though the pyramid also proved unstable and was abandoned, it marked a technical and architectural breakthrough. Heralding an important design transition, the bent pyramid displays a shift from the step pyramid to a functional smooth-sided pyramid. The bent pyramid was unique in having two separate entrances, one on the northern face and another on the western face. The chamber of this pyramid was too small for a human burial. It was probably meant for the burial of a statue designated to house the Ka, the vital spirit of the deceased king. With the Bent Pyramid, architects successfully experimented with a completely new idea. To build the pyramid with a core of huge stones settled on a progressive horizontal design. This way, each construction phase could be completed in a single stage, allowing the architect complete control over every design element. Unfortunately, these precautions did not prevent sagging or cracks in the interior rooms of the pyramid. Sneferu abandoned the monument and began the construction of yet another pyramid.
Welcome to the Red Pyramid of Dashur. The Red Pyramid was built two kilometers to the north of the Bent Pyramid. It was so named due to the reddish limestone used in its construction. The Red Pyramid reached a height of 105 meters. While the ground level of the Red Pyramid is lower than that of the Bent Pyramid, its height is virtually the same. The task of making the pyramid a geometrical, true, flat face pyramid brought about yet another new design concept the use of casing blocks. The descending corridor of the pyramid, which opens to the north, arrives at ground level, where two almost identical spectacular chambers with high ceilings are aligned north to south and connected by a short horizontal passage. In the south wall of the second chamber, accessed by a staircase, another corridor leads to the final chamber, which is built within the masonry of the pyramid itself and aligned east to west. The annexes of the Red Pyramid consist of a small funerary temple located to the east. A causeway presumably ran due east from the temple, but it has yet to be excavated.
The red pyramid was structurally sound and once finished marked a remarkable design milestone. Finally successful in his attempts to build himself a suitable funerary monument, Sneferu knew his future beyond death was assured. Welcome to Pyramids of the Middle Kingdom. During the Middle Kingdom era, the powerful rulers of the 12th dynasty resumed the tradition of elaborate pyramidal tombs. For example, Amenemhat I built a funerary complex in Lisht, and Senusret II selected the Elahun site in the Fayum. Amenemhat II and Sesostris III, however, cast their favor towards Dashur. Amenemhat III built a pyramid there as well before moving to Hawara in the Fayum. The plundering of tombs in troubled times prompted the architects of the Middle Kingdom to devise increasingly complicated means of security during construction. As such, while the architectural plans of the Hawara Pyramid were simpler than the one at Dashur, the means used to protect it from looters were much more elaborate. Beyond the use of blind passages and concealed trap doors, the architects relied on a system of stone slabs which were slid into place at the end of construction. These massive stone slabs were meant to permanently block the passageways leading to the funerary chambers. The kings of the 13th dynasty began building their pyramids at Mazguna, south of Dashur, then moved on to Fayum and Abydos. The kings of the 17th dynasty, however, satisfied themselves with crowning their cave tombs with small pyramids of raw brick. The kings of the 18th dynasty gave up the shape of the pyramid as a royal tomb entirely. They chose a mountain with a pyramidal shape in the Valley of Kings and dug their graves there. It was not until the Nubian pharaohs of the 25th dynasty that kings were once again buried under pyramidal tombs. In fact, today, the area of ancient Nubia, modern Sudan, contains a record number of 220 known pyramids, 
to Egypt's 138. Despite their slow decline in use and quality, pyramids continued to fascinate all and sundry up to the Roman era. They remain to this day a symbol of the religious dedication of the pharaohs and the grandeur of ancient Egypt. Welcome to an overview of the Giza Necropolis. The Giza Plateau is located on the west bank of the Nile and was considered by ancient Egyptians as the domain of the dead. The pyramidal complexes found there were built over the span of three generations during the reign of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara. The Giza area, now famous for its three pyramids, is part of a wider grouping of funerary complexes. Rulers from this period generally elected to be buried in the area. The focal point of the entire region was the city of Memphis, chosen as the capital of Egypt at the beginning of the Old Kingdom. The placement of the Giza monuments, and particularly that of the pyramids, followed a practical yet strict alignment. First, they focused on cardinal points, and then they accounted for the natural geology of the plateau. Welcome to the Riddles of the Sphinx. A 
a sphinx was originally meant to be a personification of the king. The human head, wearing pharaonic regalia, was fused with the body of a lion, thus sharing the qualities the powerful animal possessed, namely its power, the swiftness of its attack, and its majestic authority. By these very virtues, it was also considered a symbol of protection. Unsurprisingly, statues of sphinxes could be found along the dromas, protectors of the path taken by the gods to reach the temples. Over the centuries, enthusiasts and historians alike have wondered, who built the Sphinx? For what purpose? And who does it represent? These questions remain unanswered. Several theories do exist, however, some more credible than others. One theory supposes that Jedifre chose to pay homage to his father Khufu by building the Great Sphinx of Giza. The stone temple on the eastern face of the Sphinx would have been added later on by his brother and successor, Khafre, in order to strengthen the divine worship of their father. It would be the first Egyptian temple oriented with the sun. Another theory suggests that the Sphinx was built by Khafre and was meant to represent him. The arguments to support this hypothesis are based on the fact that the limestone beds used for the main work of the Temple of the Sphinx are geographically and architecturally similar to the Valley Temple of Khafre. Some believe that Khufu himself built the Sphinx, which was later finished under his successors, Jedifre and Khafre. These arguments are based on the stylistics of the engraving, the typology of the nemes, and the absence of a beard at the time of construction. While ancient Egypt as a whole leaves a rather monochrome vision of its monuments and statuary, it is vital to understand that in ancient times, absolutely everything was painted. The sun eating away at the pigments of the colors, the sand, the climate, and the implacable impact of time unfortunately destroyed the glorious colors of the Sphinx of Giza. Documents from an Arab Egyptologist of the 12th century Abd al-Latif al-Baghdadi indicate that traces of red were still visible in his time. Today, however, the only color that remains are traces of red close to the ears of the Sphinx, as well as hints of blue and yellow on the nemes, traditional colors for that type of headdress. The pigments for the color red were man-made, obtained by mixing different products such as clay, quartz sand, and very finely crushed hematite. Red had a strong symbolism in ancient Egypt. It was both the color of life and the color of death. It could represent the sands of the desert or the brilliance of the sun. Red was also associated with the god Seth, vengeful and destructive. The Egyptian word for red, Deshur, is also the word which was used to signify the desert or the royal crown of Lower Egypt. In art, red was also the color used to paint the bodies of men, while yellow was used for women. It is possible that there were also color restoration efforts during the Sayite period about 600 years before Cleopatra's rule, as indicated by notes on the inventory stele, discovered in 1858 by Auguste Mariette. 
It is because of this that the team made the decision to display it with its full range of colors, even though the Sphinx's colors would have likely faded by Cleopatra's time. Dating from the 4th dynasty, approximately 2600 to 2500 BCE, the Great Sphinx of Giza is the oldest and largest sphinx that we know of. Carved from a natural limestone outcrop, the sphinx measures 19.8 meters in height, 73.2 meters in length, and 14 meters in width. In order to bring polish to the imposing monument, several blocks of limestone were added after the initial construction phase. Since then, there have been numerous attempts at preservation. The polish present in the game integrates some aspects of modern restoration attempts. The team made this choice to present a more iconic version of the Sphinx of Giza to the player. Today, the Sphinx is called the Terrifying One. This appellation is translated from its Arabic name, Abu al-Hal, which in turn was derived from Baluba in Coptic. The Sphinx as a whole was carved in situ from a natural stone promontory. Its head was built in a limestone peak of the Mukatam plate, and the body was sculpted in the underlying rock layer where it is located. The degradation of the Sphinx is due in particular to wind erosion and the different quality of limestone used in its construction. The level of sodium contained in the groundwater which abuts the stone is also a contributing factor. The natural bedrock is seen through the oblique natural strata of the Sphinx's body that are similar to the surrounding limestone. Since antiquity, people have always believed there was a hidden tomb deep within the Sphinx. It is thought that attempts to plunder the Sphinx began as far back as the first intermediate period. Since then, numerous attempts to pierce the Sphinx's secrets have been carried out, leaving indelible scars upon the monument. <laughs> Twelve meters long and cut during pharaonic times, another entrance in the back of the Sphinx aroused curiosity. Although Thutmose IV attempted to seal it off, it was possibly reopened by treasure hunters. It was rediscovered by Howard Vise and mapped more recently by Mark Lehner. This entrance at the back of the Sphinx leads to different cavities of a few meters each, in directions going inside the statue's body and under the surface. The team has used this opportunity to extrapolate a little more.
While there have been no major discoveries pertaining to the Sphinx of Giza in recent years, theories and hypotheses continue to emerge. Without validation provided by archaeological sources, however, they remain unsubstantiated. The first of the main theories as to the Sphinx of Giza's meaning posits that the Sphinx was originally a massive representation of the god Anubis. Its principal arguments are that the head of the Sphinx is disproportionate compared to the size of its body. The second theory believes that the representation of two Sphinxes on the stela of Thutmose IV would indicate that another stone Sphinx had existed on the site itself, possibly even in paired symmetry on the other side of the Nile. However, neither of these theories can be verified in any way. Several scientific projects using new technologies have been put in place in the past decades. The most important was led by Mark Lehner and his team, who specialize in the study and survey of the Giza Plateau, including the Sphinx site. The mapping made it possible to see the materials used to construct the Sphinx, analyze the different layers of erosion, and figure out the most fragile areas to protect. After a few attempts at giving the Sphinx artistic proportions, the team instead decided to use photogrammetry mapping to faithfully reproduce the proportions of the Sphinx. What the Sphinx of Giza represented during its construction and how the Sphinx was perceived by the Egyptians of the New Kingdom are two very different matters. Originally a representation of the king imbued with the power of the lion, the Sphinx was eventually viewed as a direct representation of the Most Divine. It is theorized that kings of the New Kingdom believed that the Sphinx of Giza was the one who recognized and legitimized the ruler of Egypt. Thus, despite the fact the Sphinx of Giza was partially buried under the sand during his reign, Amenhotep II knew that the monument was of great importance. Amenhotep II built a second temple dedicated for the Sphinx's Horemakhet to pay homage to Khufu and Khafre, his predecessors. It became a common habit for this dynasty to spend time with their royal courts at the Sphinx. Its sanctuary became known as Setepet, the Chosen. Egyptologist Mark Lehner believed that Amenhotep II built a statue of himself anchored between the paws of the Sphinx, likely to legitimize his reign, alongside a stela found by Salim Hassan. Many other pharaohs of this dynasty, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, also left marks of their passage in a similar fashion, sometimes even stripping the stones of nearby temples and pyramids to do so. Amenhotep II's son and successor, Thutmose IV, was a frequent offender. While sleeping between the Sphinx's paws, the future Thutmose IV saw in a dream the god Horamaket, 
proclaiming his coming accession on the throne of the two lands. This was, of course, on the condition that he remove all of the sand covering the Sphinx, which stood guard as the personification of the god, and should thus never be engulfed by the sands of the desert. The 15-ton dream stela built by Thutmose IV to commemorate his dream was discovered by an Italian Egyptologist, Giovanni Battista Caviglia, in 1818, when he undertook the task of freeing the Sphinx from the sand, which had, yet again, covered it. Caviglia was looking for an entrance into the structure of the Sphinx, but instead he discovered an open-air chapel and stelas between the paws. Ashes from a ceremony were still present, Protected by sand, they quite possibly were from the last ceremonies in Roman times. That same year, Caviglia discovered fragments of the Sphinx's beard that had probably been added during the New Kingdom. If many of these pieces are held by museums in Cairo, a fragment is displayed at the British Museum, along with a piece of the ureus that was on the Sphinx's headdress. It is believed this fragment of beard was possibly kept in place thanks to the statue of Amenhotep II, which was supposed to be located under the head of the Sphinx. A popular cultural legend purports that the nose of the Sphinx of Giza was lost during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte to the cannon fire of French soldiers in training. However, engravings from before the time of that campaign already depicted the Sphinx without a nose, indicating that it had been removed before the French campaign. The most plausible hypothesis is based on the research of the German historian Ulrich Harman. During the 1980s, Harman compiled medieval sources written by Arab authors. In doing so, he discovered that the Sphinx was once perceived as a favorable omen, a deity supporting sediment-nurturing floods and crops. Around 1378, a Sufi by the name of Mohammed Saim al-Dar could not stand this vision of the monument and in an iconoclastic act, broke the nose of the Sphinx. According to the texts, he was then hanged and burned between the legs of the Sphinx for his crime. Welcome to Khufu's Funerary Complex. The Valley Temple was the first architectural component encountered when one entered the funerary complex. It was considered the official entrance of the tomb and mixed the structural components of both a temple and a portico. Khufu's Valley Temple shows evidence of a basalt pavement letting us know where the portico portion of the structure was located. Such a partition is believed to symbolize both the subterranean and solar aspects of the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> 
Khufu's causeway ran from the floodplain up to the plateau, linking together the valley temple and the mortuary temple. A traditional causeway presented itself as a paved path, enclosed by walls and often roofed. Fragments discovered by archaeologists indicate that the walls in Khufu's causeway, one of the longest known to us, were decorated with carvings and possibly paint. Depictions show a great variety of themes, stars on the ceiling, accompanied by scenes of battles on the walls. Other engravings depicted the creation of the complex by illustrating craftsmen at work. The most impressive private cemeteries of Giza are located east and west of Khufu's pyramid. The eastern cemetery was reserved for members of the royal family, while the western cemetery was mostly set aside for various court dignitaries. In both areas, private tombs, also known as mastabas, were aligned and laid out methodically in streets and avenues. This arrangement was probably an attempt at recreating the king's court for the afterlife. To the east of Khufu's pyramid reside three smaller constructions, the three Queen's Pyramids. A sloping passage led from the ground surface to a burial chamber, cut out of the bedrock and lined with masonry. If it seems quite certain that these monuments were intended for Queen's burials, the identity of the original occupants is hard to assess.
The northernmost pyramid was most likely meant for Queen Hetepharis, who is believed to have been Khufu's mother. However, in 1925, her actual tomb was discovered nearby by accident. It was hidden at the bottom of a deep masonry pit in an underground chamber. Within the concealed chamber, Egyptologists discovered the most complete royal funerary equipment dating from the Old Kingdom, though her body was missing. Within the vicinity of Khufu's pyramid, Egyptologists have uncovered seven boat pits. The exact function of such boat-shaped pits remains unconfirmed, though one can easily conjecture that it was symbolic in nature. The boat pits being located at the eastern side of the pyramid, at the precise spot where the resuscitated king was supposed to reappear, could constitute evidence to support such an assumption. The two southern boat pits, each covered by a roof of huge limestone slabs, were discovered in 1954 by Kamal al-Malak, an Egyptian Egyptologist. Only one of them had been opened. 1,224 boat parts made of cedar wood were retrieved one by one and patiently reassembled by the master restorer Ahmed Youssef. This process took 28 years. Yusef worked by following lines of mortise and tenon joints and by stitching parts together with vegetable ropes, all in order to keep the design as authentic as possible. The Greek term pyramidion refers to the capstone of a pyramid or the tip of an obelisk. In ancient Egyptian, both components were called benben. This word was also used for a specific kind of food, a cone-shaped offering made of bread. The pyramidion was intended to be a miniature reproduction of the pyramid, making it equal to the monument itself in symbolic importance. A few pyramidia have been retrieved from pyramidal complexes. The earliest, found in Dashur, is undoubtedly a good example of Old Kingdom's pyramidia. It is made of limestone and has no inscriptions. Some engraved pyramidia were recovered from private funerary chapels. Their inscriptions all related to the solar symbolism of the Benben. Pyramidia of the Pyramids of Giza were never recovered. The reconstitution you see in the game is fictive. 
incorporating a golden pyramidion bearing inscriptions relevant to Khufu. Welcome to Secrets of the Great Pyramid. Built around 2550 BCE, the Great Pyramid of Giza is considered one of the most iconic structures of Egypt. It is the biggest of the pyramids and the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still standing. The numbers associated to the Great Pyramid of Giza are impressive. A workforce of over 20,000 people, 6 million tons of stone, and 20 years of construction. It was a massive undertaking for a pharaoh's tomb. The construction of the Great Pyramid was also a display of power and opulence on the part of Khufu. It is part of the pharaoh's vast funerary complex, which also includes two temples, three satellite pyramids, a causeway, and a builder's necropolis. We can guess that the intent behind the construction of these monuments was Khufu's way of declaring himself one of the most powerful pharaohs to rule a unified Egypt. New insights into engineering and ancient Egyptian culture are still being revealed over 4,500 years later. For example, a recently unearthed papyrus offers a glimpse into the life of a tradesman at the time of the pyramid's construction. Also, a logbook belonging to a team leader during the building gives details on the craftsmen, their work schedules, and the raw materials required. It is interesting to note that by Cleopatra's time, the pyramid's celestial purpose, its construction, and the function of its mysterious inner chambers was already unclear. Today, it is only through dedicated research that we have begun to grasp some of the Great Pyramid's mysteries. The Egyptians had polished their design for centuries by the time work on the Great Pyramid began. Intended as a tomb for Khufu, the Great Pyramid's structural design has been considered to be nearly perfect by engineers and historians ever since.
Precisely oriented north-south to the four cardinal points of a compass, the length of each side of the Great Pyramid at its base was 230 meters, and its original height was 147 meters. The pyramid is a mere 0.05% error away from being a perfect square. In order to achieve the shape of a true pyramid, the design required many considerations in the planning phases as well as precision during execution. It was especially critical that they control the angle of inclination on all sides at every stage of construction. Materials for the Great Pyramid consisted of quarried limestone blocks, weighing between 2 to 15 tons each. The methods of moving these blocks into place is still debated by architects and Egyptologists. The precision of its design in an age with only soft metal tools, as well as the enormous scale of its construction, make the Great Pyramid one of the most impressive feats of human engineering. It's estimated that it took between 600,000 and 2 million blocks of stone to build the Great Pyramid. Experts calculate it would have required men to move 12 blocks every hour around the clock for 20 years to place the 2.3 million stones the monument is made of. While the interior chambers were built with red granite from a swan, most of the pyramid was made from local limestone, weighing between 2 to 15 tons per block. There is debate on how the pyramid stones were moved into place. Recent research is exploring the idea that it was built around a large interior ramp. The recently discovered logbook confirms that the high-quality limestone of the outer casing was brought by boat across the Nile from a quarry in Tura. Once complete, the smooth white polished stone of the Great Pyramid would have reflected the sunlight like a beacon, earning it the name the Horizon of Khufu. Over the centuries, thieves and travelers attempted to access the Great Pyramid numerous times. Ancient writings describe details of its interior, proof that some made their way within, though who gained entrance first and when is unknown. The main entrance of the Great Pyramid is located 17 meters above ground level. It faces north, likely in order to align with the North Star. Though the entrance passageway had been discovered in antiquity, any further access into the Great Pyramid was stopped by massive vertical slabs of rock. As such, present-day visitors to the pyramid must use the robber's entrance. The 
The robber's entrance is reported to have been opened in the 9th century by Caliph al-Mamun. In search of treasure, the Caliph had his men dig their way inside the Great Pyramid. The most likely scenario is that they enlarged a corridor which had been created by tomb robbers during antiquity. As such, this is how the team can justify access to this wonder. Attempts to gain entry to the Great Pyramid and uncover its potential secrets continued throughout the centuries. In the 19th century, the belief that another entry existed at the south side resulted in a hole being blasted into the pyramid's side, with no results for the damage that was done. While the search is still ongoing today to uncover more hidden rooms and passageways, conservation is the primary concern of all such efforts. Welcome to the Great Pyramid Subterranean Chamber. 
From the original entrance of the Great Pyramid, there is a passage leading to the subterranean chamber. Its walls were carved out of the existing rock of the plateau and then covered in a fine, unmarked limestone. The descending passage has a steep 26 degree downward slope. Narrow and with a low ceiling, this pathway is long and challenging. While the original passage was 145 meters long, the team reduced its length and made it both wider and higher. The main focus of the work in reproducing the location was centered upon preserving the unique claustrophobic environment of the Great Pyramid, while still allowing for a smooth game navigation. The well shaft was a 58 meter vertical passage that connected the descending corridor to the grand gallery above. An adjacent grotto may have originally been a small natural well in the bedrock that was enlarged during the tunneling. Whether the grotto was intended for another purpose is uncertain. There is much speculation over the purpose of the well shaft. One theory is that the channel was cut or enlarged to supply air to workers in the descending passage. Another is that it was meant to provide an exit route once the work was done in the heart of the pyramid. Without the well shaft, workers would have been trapped inside forever when the grand gallery was sealed. The opening at the bottom of the well shaft was most likely sealed by exiting workers to camouflage the passageway. There is a subterranean chamber at the end of the descending corridor, 30 meters below the Giza Plateau surface. Dug directly into the bedrock, the space is wide with a ceiling 3 meters in height. Its floors and walls are rough and uneven, indicating that it was never completed. At the south end of the room, there is another narrow corridor, similar to the others, though it abruptly ends after roughly 20 meters. The chamber also contains an 11 meter pit near the east side. It's unclear what this may have been used for. In the game, this well leads to a fictive underground complex containing key game related mysteries. The subterranean chamber's original purpose remains a mystery. One popular theory is that it was originally meant to be Khufu's burial chamber, but the pharaoh changed his mind, preferring to be buried higher up in the pyramid, which would explain the chamber's unfinished state. Great Pyramid of Giza, Upper Chambers.
At the entrance of the ascending passage are three granite flagstones estimated to weigh up to 25 tons each. They were used to protect the Great Pyramid from thieves. Undaunted by the granite blocks, the thieves simply dug into the softer limestone around them, thus creating the robber's entrance. While in reality the robber's entrance is one single cavity which leads to both passages, in the game, the team created individual accesses to either passage. As such, in the game, one entrance leads to the ascending passage, while another leads to the descending passage. The ascending passageway of the Great Pyramid provides a direct path into the Grand Gallery and is accessed 30 meters from the entrance along the descending corridor. Both corridors have similar dimensions and are designed with the same 26 degree incline. The ascending corridor has smooth masonry on its walls and the layout includes many trapezoidal stones. Both the floor and ceiling of the passageway indicate that the passage was enlarged, possibly during or after the funeral, to allow workers room to move granite blocks meant to plug the corridor. The Grand Gallery's purpose is still debated among experts. It may have been intended to align with the stars, act as a buffer to protect the king's chamber, or simply to facilitate the transport of the granite blocks used inside the pyramid. Access to the queen's chamber was at the beginning of the Grand Gallery. Though this room is referred to as the Queen's Chamber, it is believed that there was no queen buried here. Based on their knowledge of earlier pyramids, Egyptologists believe it was more likely intended as the King's Serdab, a chamber meant to contain the Ka statue, which would in turn house the King's spirit. Situated exactly within the pyramid's center, on the east-west axis of the pyramid, the chamber has a vaulted ceiling and measures 5.7 by 5.2 meters. In the eastern wall, there is a niche tucked away in a small corbelled archway, which may have originally held the Ka statue. Behind this niche is another smaller hole, possibly dug out by thieves in search of further treasure. In the 19th century, two shafts were found running through the north and south walls. They each run in a horizontal line for two meters before sloping upward, and both are closed off with limestone blocks fitted with copper handles. Whether they were intended as ventilation shafts for workers or a celestial connection for the pharaoh's spirit is unconfirmed. A recent scan of the room indicated the presence of an unknown cavity hidden behind the north face of the walls over the descending corridor. 
Further investigation is still ongoing to ascertain the nature of the anomaly so as to avoid risking damage to the monument. Khufu's architects were possibly influenced by earlier rhomboidal pyramids when designing the gallery. It is the longest corbelled vault ever built, measuring 47 meters long and 8.6 meters high. The walls were made to taper inward, allowing for better distribution of weight. As a result, the ceiling measures just over a meter wide at its highest point. Though this construction technique is present in other pyramids, few have the same precision and stability. While the space is visually dramatic, the gallery seemed to serve a practical function, though what exactly remains uncertain. Still, the wall design was undoubtedly meant to contribute to the stability of the structure, and its floor may have helped workers move the materials. A channel runs along the middle of the room. A movable floor originally rested in this central recess. The raised benches on either side are equipped with slots that may have been used to help position the granite blocking stones. At the end of the Grand Gallery is the entrance to the antechamber leading to the King's Chamber. Directly above, there is another narrower horizontal passage that connects to the top of the King's Chamber and allow the workers access to the weight relief rooms. The far end of the Grand Gallery leads to a small antechamber with a portcullis, preventing access to the King's Chamber. The portcullis was composed of three separate granite slabs. They were designed to be lowered into place and seal the chamber after the burial of the King. The grooves dug out to hold the slabs in place are still clearly visible to this day. The elaborate locking system was composed of a series of grooves for the ropes and pulleys that dropped the stones into place like the notches on a key. For the purposes of the game, the team elected to remove the portcullis slabs in order to grant the player access to the king's chamber. In reality, workers would have backed out of the room after the funeral, lowering each slab into place behind them one at a time. Each of the three stones were smashed by looters centuries later, and evidence of their break-in is still evident. The king's chamber is built entirely out of red granite. The king's chamber measures 5.8 meters in height. It has an imposing cover of five stacked levels above, with granite beams weighing 25 to 40 tons each. The uppermost level is surmounted by a vault of stones, arranged in chevrons to bear the enormous structural load. Thank you. 
As in the Queen's Chamber, two shafts extend out from the room towards the north and south faces of the pyramid. They measure nearly 64 meters until they are blocked by copper-handled granite plugs. Some experts in the culture of the Old Kingdom believe that the shafts were thought to lead the king's soul to the stars, with the incarnation of the pharaoh as the god Ra, represented by the northern well, and the god Horus by the southern well. There is a granite sarcophagus at the west end of the room, but it is the concealed construction inscriptions left by workmen on the roof's stones which verify this as the resting place of Khufu. The sarcophagus was recorded as being empty when it was discovered, and its design indicates that there was once a lid in place. It's possible that this sarcophagus is only a cenotaph in memory of the pharaoh, but was never actually meant to receive the body. Khufu's mummy was never found. It is hoped that as of yet undiscovered hidden rooms and shafts of the pyramid may provide an answer as to its location. Welcome to Jean-Pierre Houdin's Theories. The team wanted to provide players with a sense of exploration and discovery, particularly within the Great Pyramid. As such, a decision was made that the internal design of the monument in the game would reflect Jean-Pierre Houdin's theories. While the antechambers of the king's tomb have yet to be discovered, Houdin posits that this is merely due to a unique design, placing the pharaoh's tomb at the center of the pyramid. The entire tour you are about to take was designed along Houdin's hypotheses. While respecting Houdin's hypothesis as to the general layout of the antechambers, the team wanted the contents to enhance the game experience. In regular royal tombs, the antechambers were filled with all the material goods needed by the pharaoh in the afterlife. To support the feelings of discovery and awe, the art team created a unique and fantastical treasure in this second antechamber. Houdin theorized that the ascending corridor and the great gallery were used by the workers to haul hoist the heavy beams above the king's chamber. He called it the service circuit. The corridor you are in now was created by the team following Houdin's theory and is referred to as the noble circuit. It is through this corridor that the wooden sarcophagus containing the pharaoh's mummy would have been transported to its final resting chamber.
With this structure in mind, one can easily assume that the pyramid's entrance would have been connected to the two antechambers. Modern research has revealed that a cavity might be located behind the north face chevrons of the pyramid. As such, the team chose to create this area for the player to explore. Here is where Houdin believes that the priests and nobles would have exited the pyramid after the burial ceremony. Many theories regarding the construction of the Great Pyramid rely on the usage of external ramps. However, Houdin believes an external ramp would have been too steep for the upper portion of the pyramid. This is why he posits that there were two ramps, an external ramp for about half of the height of the pyramid, which then became an internal ramp for the second half. Houdin's theory states that this internal ramp followed the sides of the pyramid in an ascending spiral pattern. A notch discovered in the edge of the Great Pyramid, known as Bob's Room, seems to support this theory. Located at the corners of each edge of the pyramid, these large rooms would have allowed workers to turn the stone by 90 degrees, allowing them to continue the ascent. The team chose to create rooms such as this one bringing Houdin's hypothesis to life. This long corridor was the first section of the ascending internal ramp. Through it, the blocks used to build the Great Pyramid would have been carefully moved upward and then turned at each edge of the pyramid in order to continue their ascent. Though the team only created the main ramp for the game, Houdet posits that this ramp had two levels, allowing workers to return safely to the bottom thanks to an additional corbelled upper section. According to Houdet, the start of the inner ramp was located at the base of the southeastern face of the pyramid. This location would have been the junction point of the external and internal ramps. Below us, workers would have built the lower part of the pyramid with the external ramp before eventually switching to the internal ramp for the middle and upper sections of the pyramid. At that time in the process, they could have reused the material of the external ramp to fill the center of the pyramid, hauling the stones in through the internal ramp.
Welcome to Coffrey's Funerary Complex. Since the very beginning of the Fourth Dynasty, mortuary temples were built adjacent to pyramids on the eastern side. Such a location, facing the rising sun, as well as the world of the living as a whole, held an important symbolic meaning, for it was within the mortuary temple that kings were revived through daily rituals. In its standard form, a mortuary temple was divided into two parts. A front area, which consisted of a vestibule and a courtyard, and an area in the back, where all sacred elements were located. The back of the temple incorporated several essential features, including an inner sanctuary with a false door, which allowed the soul of the pharaoh to travel between the world of the dead and the world of the living. The largest of all such structures, Khafre's Mortuary Temple, was entirely built with megalithic blocks of limestone from a nearby quarry and encased with granite. Parts of Khafre's Mortuary Temple, particularly the courtyard walls, are thought to have been decorated with splendid reliefs. However, not a single image of the king has been discovered inside the Mortuary Temple. Khufu's direct successor, Jedifrey, followed the custom which required each king to establish a new site for their funerary accommodation and chose Abu Rawash as his last resting place. When the time came to build his own funerary complex, Khafre, also one of Khufu's sons and the successor to Jedifrey, broke with tradition and returned to Giza. Not only did Khafre thumb his nose at tradition, but he did so in a way which he hoped would allow him to overshadow his father's most important monument. Yalla, yalla. Though Khafre's pyramid is smaller than Khufu's, it was cunningly built on a more elevated bedrock layer than the Great Pyramid, making it appear higher than any other pyramid at Giza. Today, Khafre's pyramid is the only one among the three at Giza that still has the upper part of its limestone casing. Considered a most sacred area, the Giza necropolis was strictly defined, both geographically and physically. An eight meter thick Tura limestone wall completely surrounded the Great Pyramid. The only way inside would have been through the mortuary temple. From the reign of Sneferu and onwards, 
the subsidiary pyramid became a common feature within the pyramidal complex. The function of the subsidiary pyramid, however, smaller in size and in height than the royal tomb, remains unclear, though some believe that it was meant to house the Ka of the pharaoh. In mainstream media, the Ka is often defined as the soul of the deceased. The truth is a bit more complicated. Within the ancient Egyptian funerary belief system, the Ka was a component of a living person, which separated itself from the body at the time of death. It represented the deceased's vital essence. In order for the deceased to ascend to a new life, whether in this world or the next, the Ka had to be embodied in a statue and its existence maintained through offerings and rituals. Within Khafre's subsidiary pyramid, a wooden box containing pieces of cedar was discovered by archaeologists. When reassembled, it turned out to be a shrine mounted on a sled. Just as with the solar barges found around Khufu's pyramid, it seems Khafre's shrine and sled were ritually disposed of after his funeral. Welcome to Menkara's Funerary Complex. The dimensions of Menkara's pyramid are much less grandiose. However, unlike its predecessors, Menkara's pyramid shows a great deal of complexity in its internal and external finish. The outside was partially covered in red granite, while the internal walls were richly decorated. This latter innovation would not catch on until the end of the 5th dynasty, when pyramid texts began to adorn the walls. Menkara's pyramid contains two sloping passages, both located in the northern side of the structure. The upper one was abandoned during the construction phase, whereas the lower one, slightly above the base of the monument, constitutes the real entrance. The lower passage leads to a first room, which, for the first time since the reign of Djoser, is decorated with engraved false doors. While Menkara's pyramid complex was unfinished at the time of his death, it was hastily and somewhat shabbily completed by his successor, Shepsikov. Even so, this funerary structure marks a watershed in the history of this kind of monument. From then onwards, the pyramid shrank, whereas the mortuary temple expanded both in its quantitative and qualitative aspects. Of particular note, it is within Menkara's mortuary temple that one can find the heaviest block of limestone ever used for a pyramid complex, weighing in at over 200 tons. <laughs> 
Menkara's causeway was completed in mud brick by the king's successor, whereas the lower part was nothing more than a simple ramp. As for the valley temple, it was built in two phases. The foundations were first laid out in limestone during Menkara's reign, but the temple itself was completed in mud brick afterwards. As such, the valley temple was soon damaged and ended up being completely rebuilt during the Sixth Dynasty. Three small structures, referred to as Menkara's Queen's Pyramids, were erected along the southern side of the main pyramid. One of them was a smooth-faced pyramid, while the other two were more basic step pyramids. It is difficult to assess whether the latter were designed as such or were left unfinished with no casing to smooth out their surfaces. The easternmost pyramid was built with the traditional rooms and corridors found within a satellite pyramid meant to house the king's ka. However, a granite sarcophagus was found within leading to the conclusion that it was used as an actual tomb rather than as a symbolic cenotaph. Drawing on these observations, some assume that this pyramid was first built as a satellite pyramid for the king's ka before seeing its purpose change to that of a queen's tomb. Which queen, however, remains a mystery. Mm -hmm. 